Thanks everyone for attending. Um, my name is Ryan Reese. I'll be kind of the host and moderator for today's conversation, uh, ETL migrations with AWS, uh, talking a lot about serverless data integration and you know one of our favorite serv services, Glue. Uh, today I have with me Ashley, who's one of our senior big data engineers here at Mission, kind of our Airflow expert, really starting to master glue on on several projects and she's going to talk through you know what what she's had to do for a big migration that we've been doing lately and then marty's here to kind of go through a lot of thoughts uh you know just on on what's going on in the ecosystem kind of where migrations are happening and, and all those good things um so we're we're trying a new feature in um Go to meeting where I might get to use the keyboard, but maybe not. Uh, no, Ashley, can you advance the slide? Sure. Uh, cool. So, what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to give you the 30 second spiel about mission real quickly. Kind of walk through the speakers already, but you know, just go over one or two more details. We'll talk about trends and challenges in data integration today. You know, this is obviously a big topic. You know, when you hear AWS speak, they feel that, you know, less than 40% of companies have actually made it the migration into the cloud. So, you know, this is still a very big topic. You know, we talk to customers all day about ETL, how, how to do it, how to bring things, you know, whether it's on-premise, how to connect to APIs, you know, all those, those great, uh, you know, pieces that you need as you're building out your data lake. Um, we'll talk some about moving from third-party ETL tools into native AWS tools. And then Ashley's gonna walk through all the steps to do that migration, right? The discovery phase, design, actually implement your solution, validate that it's working, operationalize it, and then think about, hey, have I made this the most cost-effective possible? Um, you know, and then kind of the next steps from there. Uh, next slide. So, you know, as we discussed, um, you know, here's our team for today. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me after this presentation. My email's there, happy to get an answer to any question that you may have. Uh, you know, we always look forward to questions people have. It's, it's often, you know, thought provoking. Uh, and then, you know, as, as mentioned, Marty's here to, to go over the next several slides and then Ashley will be your main presenter as she does all the real work and we just kind of hang out uh, at the end of the day. Uh, next slide. I think we lost our about mission slide, Ashley. It's two slides up. It just so got quick discuss, quick 30 seconds on mission. Um, we are an AWS premier partner. So all we do is AWS. We're 100% focused on AWS. We've worked in this ecosystem for the last five years. Uh, we have you know, hundreds of people on the team, everyone has certs, and we've got lots of AWS competencies, uh, you know, ones that are prevalent to today, data and analytics. So AWS has come through, reviewed our projects, certified that, hey, these guys really know what they're doing. We also have service delivery designations in Redshift and QuickSight, which are important uh, tools in that data lake. So you know, if you guys are looking for support, you know, missions here, we've got a very deep bench on data analytics and can help you, uh, you know, solve all those problems in your data space. Uh, so go, go a couple of slides, Ashley, and then Marty will talk about trends. Yeah, so um, thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm here to just talk to you a little bit about trends and challenges in data integration. Uh, you know, what's going on out there in the market and what we're seeing uh, here at Mission with what people are bringing to us um, before I hand it off to Ashley to go through the details. Um, Ashley, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So, you know, we all know these trends, right? Data is growing like crazy. It hasn't stopped growing. Um, you know, it doubles every year and a half. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting facts out there. You know, there's more bits in the world now than there are stars in the known universe. I mean, there is just a ton of data around to be analyzed. Uh, and typically that data needs to be moved, right? It's coming from all over the place now, from tons of different news sources, right? IoT devices that are out there, we're bringing lots of data in. 
Um, you know, it's increasingly diverse. We're not just looking at, you know, structured data anymore. We're looking at videos and audio and, and converting text, you know, to audio and audio to text and, and doing analytics on all of those different pieces, right? Um, so whenever we're thinking about data now, it isn't, you know, just, you know, extract, transform and load. It's, it's taking into account the different types of data that are there as well. Uh, you know, and we're trying to, you know, democratize data use. So when we look at this, people, we don't just want to have data in the hands of IT. We want to have data in the hands of the business. Uh, so how quickly can we actually take care of the movement of data to get people to uh, have the data to be able to do the analytics that they need to be able to do? Um, and, you know, our data is used all over the place. So not only are we moving it into data warehouses, but that data does move from you know application to application there's downstream applications and it's accessing all of that data from everywhere uh so you know kind of that idea of being able to move data everywhere and be able to use that data um, and have that data be ready and primed for the use of the people that need to be able to use it so you know the trend is really you know trying to open up data as much as possible move that data quickly and make it usable uh, next slide please so, you know, typically we see, you know, two types of, you know, data movement. You have batch. Uh, this has, you know, been around for a long time, moving data, creating large jobs to be able to move data out of, you know, um, mainframes and, you know, get that data kind of moved into a central storage, like a data warehouse or a data lake. Uh, you know, they're nightly jobs. They usually have to be run in concert with a lot of other jobs to be able to make sure that data gets, gets populated in the correct place at the right time. Um, to be able to use that data. And then there's more real time, right? Small batch jobs, you know, micro batches, uh, being able to be very responsive, get that data that's coming in, you know, maybe from IoT devices, uh, you know, get that data so that it's being monitored and can do alerts uh, and, and really is giving you kind of that real time view of what's going on either with your business or whatever it is that you, you know, are, are interested in. Uh, you know, both of these still have, you know, large you know usage uh for you know profiles within any co any corporation right so you know aws in this case is able to handle both batch and you know the real-time jobs uh next slide please oh, i think we just went yeah there we go so the challenge is you know most of the time when we think about you know how we've done etl or elt in the past is we do this mostly on premise, uh, so you know, and we do it with large with with tools, right? Uh, things like uh, Informatica, Talent, those different types of tools that are out there, and you know, it's not very easy to scale that. Uh, you know, just like anything else on premises, you know, whenever you're going to go and move into the you know next level of being able to move data, or if suddenly your business grows and you have more data than you expected. Uh, it's a long lead time to then expand those tools and, and get them scaled out to be able to be used. Um, typically, you know, there's a pretty high cost with this. Yeah, no matter how much data you're moving, uh, you're going to have to pay, you know, a yearly fee. So there's no on demand. You know, if you have lulls in your data, you're still paying um, the same amount to be able to use that tool or use that system. And you're getting locked in, right? You're you're not writing this in typical languages that are out there today for processing data like Python, uh, you're doing the, you know, proprietary language of whichever tool you purchase to be able to do the ETL. Uh, so, you know, this, it just can't handle necessarily the way that workloads are working today, getting data in from all kinds of different devices, not just moving data out of a mainframe and putting it into a more modern uh, database technology. Uh, go ahead and to the next slide. So, you know, I'll just do a couple minutes on these slides and then we'll go go into what Ashley's presenting. So next slide, please. You know, these are the typical third party tools that you'll see out there. Um, they've been around a long time, moving lots and lots of data and still move lots and lots of data. Right. You know, 50 percent of the world's technology is still in data in uh, mainframes. Uh, and a lot of these are moving data out of those mainframes and, and putting them into more modern databases. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So migrating into AWS, one of the things that we've talked about is, is that, you know, the changes really in data are, is that it's, you know, business driven, right? We want it to be business driven. It isn't just a technical need in order to move that data. 
right? We want to make sure that the business is getting the data that they're going to need. And the other thing is, is that ETL is akin a lot of times to doing any software development. There's been a lot of talk over the years of basically, hey, you know, we're just going to move this data and moving data isn't really that complicated, but we found out that really it is quite complex, right? So when you do any sort of project, you want to make sure you move through all the, the different phases that we see here, right? You want to discover what is out there currently, you know, how it's being done, um, why it's being done. Uh, and then you want to design to make sure that you're going to be able to meet the business needs right of that and be able to move you know from a third party tool into a more you know modern architecture um and then when you're implementing it there's all kinds of you have a choice now instead of it being the exact same way every time depending on what the business needs and depending on where this data is coming from out in aws you have a lot of different services that can be used to be able to you know having that choice gives you the flexibility to be able to meet the business needs quicker um, you know being able to then go validate that all of the data being moved is the data you expect to be able to be moved and then operationalize that data right and ensure that you know you have a monthly metrics driven performance and you're able to monitor all of the data that's moving on and you're able to give the business the data that they want so you know following through all of these different phases is very important um, it's not just a one-time thing when you go through and do ETL. It's something that you have to revisit. Uh, so anyway, AWS does help make that a little bit easier. Um, you can go to the next slide, and I'm going to hand it over to Ashley now. Thank you. All right, guys. Um, discovery. So discovery is an interesting part of our kind of like onboarding of a client, right? Um, we have to talk to the client and ask them various questions about their business logic, about their backend um, database pools, or, um, you know, what they do with their data as well, machine learning, anything that has to do with their data um, for their project, for their products, right? Um, some of the things that sometimes we kind of have to look at also is, um, you know, what are their ETL jobs that they have already current? Um, are they able to be dynamically programmed? Can they be transitioned to multiple clients if that's what a project or client can um, has? Um, and then afterwards, of course, like what about their end users? Like how will their end users actually visualize the data as well? Are they going to use dashboards, quick sites, um, any other type of applications that they may run? And how are they having that distributed for their users as well? And sometimes we kind of think like okay, discovery can only be done on the first week, right? No, I feel like that is not the correct way of looking at discovery. Even as we're designing and then implementing, we are still finding out things that we didn't catch we, or the client just didn't realize. Um, and that's what we have to kind of uh, continue on, right? It's kind of like an ongoing thing until you actually have a finalized product for them. Um, so after we get in a little bit of discovery, we also have to understand like our own tools that we're going to use, right? So here is just a little um, PowerPoint of all the tools that we possibly may use for ETL. We have AWS Glue, Lambda, uh, Manage Apache Airflow, Step Functions, and they all have their purpose and their limitations as well. Right. Um, most of these tools, you don't really have to worry about the infrastructure, which is great. Um, that's something that you don't have to really you know, focus time on. Um, also, there may have some maybe uh, schema kind of discovery. So as in for AWS Glue, you don't really have to worry about what are the data types. It can sort of, you know, understand what type of data, data types are coming in as it's reading that data or even the workflows, right? Um, we have our sub functions that will try to automate as much as possible all the different parts and steps that are needed for your data to be um, ingested and then analyzed, right? Um, and design. And one other thing about that design is that limitation of those products, right? Um, we're talking about what's the limitation of Lambda and what is the limitation of Airflow, right? Sometimes do we get the, you know, boggled down to one service or do we try to implement as many services as we can that will kind of work with our data itself or even the business logic, right? Um, Design kind of uncover a lot of things. Um, here is the AWS service needed, right? You don't always have to go for one. We can go for multiple tools that'll do the same job and it can be just as cost efficient as all the other ones, right? Um, 
we also want to take uh, an account of how autonomous that pipeline is. Uh, do we want to, you know, add in certain aspects of software engineering concepts to our ETL process? And I feel like sometimes that is an underutilized um, way of looking at our ETL processes as well. Um, here, I just want to make that question, right? Is our ETL pipeline autonomous? And the first thing that I feel that I've come across a lot of our clients is that this process isn't really controlled in any way. So if can we get this process in a kind of like source control environment? Can it also be a continuous integration? Can it be continuously deployed? Can we use that within our AWS ecosystem? And most of the time we can, just I don't usually see a lot of clients do that. And I feel like that's very underutilized because sometimes a user, someone who is a developer on AWS can you know, insert any type of bugs um, and then the troubleshooting and debugging gets very complicated within all of the services. You have to go digging into many things and many loggings in CloudWatch. And we need to get that first step, you know, safely guarded as much as you can, which is, Let's put that there. Let's make our user, our developers, our engineers be able to get approvals on updates, make sure that there's no bugs that being introduced in our ETL process, and let's have that view um, within our metrics whenever we are doing our deployments, our releases for updated code or anything new features that get in the process, right? Um, the second little thing is, is it scheduled or is it event driven? Now, I feel like there's a lot of Kind of difficulties about understanding this scheduling isn't really something that's outdated or not it's just depending on what your job is right so most of the time i would probably schedule if i'm trying to get data from an outside source sometimes that system there only gets data at a certain time they only drop data at a certain time and we need to be able to get that data at that time too um, we want to kind of introduce some SLAs, uh, you know, if it doesn't grab data from that time, let's, you know, do some dynamic uh, waiting periods for that, um, those jobs to run again. And that can be very powerful when it's introduced with also event-driven um, processes, which event-driven processes is really good. You know, we already have our S3 pipelines or S3, I'm sorry, buckets available. Um, your clients are using possibly maybe SFTP family, transfer family, and they're dropping their own data there. So we are not worried about having to do some scheduling. That's when we kind of want to introduce that, you know, event driven, right? Do you want to base it on that S3 event? When that happens, let's do a couple of jobs. You probably end up using some Lambda to, um, you know, go through that data. Um, you can also, you know, run other services from that Lambda job. You can run the step function, you can run um, Glue, uh, anything that's in your kind of, you know, repertoire that you can use in AWS itself. Um, and then, of course, the question is, which AWS tools? And I've mentioned this before. Um, you don't want to kind of stay boggled down one tool. You want to be able to implement as many tools you can that would do the job most efficiently and um, where you're able to do logging and do any type of control or debugging or any of that sort, right? You don't want it to be boggled down to one service where that service will go down, um, and then none of your else, none of your ETL jobs will start running. Um, you kind of want to spread that out, and depending on the business logic as well and what you want that for. Um, and that kind of trickle down to do we only use that one service and tool, and then is my dynamic. How dynamic is my code, right? Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes you have these clients, and I usually have clients who will have multiple clients, right? And they want to use that same code pack on every single client of theirs. And we, I kind of have to figure out what is the best way for me to do that. And usually I'll go through like Python packages. I'll create Python packages that will just take in a couple of possibly client configuration parameters or, um, you know, specific business logic values that it really does um, make your, you know, tool be able to be distributed on to multiple clients. And that sometimes can come from like a database table. Um, these values can come somewhere else. It can come from a file file anyone puts down. And you kind of have to think about those type of things whenever you're creating this process or, you know, the proof of concept of that process. Um, kind of knowing the limits to each service. And what I mean by that is, 
what I mentioned before, like Lambda. Lambda, we know that there's like a 15 minute, you know, hard timeout, can't go past that or error out. And sometimes you need to know if your business logic or if that process for that one data pipeline is going to exceed that, right? You kind of need to know how much data you're going to be working with, how long it can actually run with that. And if it doesn't, then let's use an actual different service that will run that data. And you can still use it via the Lambda, but you just got to make sure that, you know, you you kind of understand what's the limits to Lambda itself. Um, with AWS Glue, it's the same thing, right? We have some different things happening. Um, you know, you're talking about 48 hour timeouts, if it needs to be that longer, which usually it doesn't. So that's usually not a huge deal, um, but it actually works out well with, you know, finding troubleshooting bugs or if for some reason it errored out and you never gotten any type of transformations out of it. And if, you know, nothing happened after 48 hours has run, um, you kind of want to limit that though yourself, you know, customize that um, into two hours, maybe three hours, depending on what your job should be doing and how much data is handling. Um, another limitation would be those restrictive packages, right? It can't really, um, you can't put every single type of package on there. You know, Blue can use, um, can only update up to a certain amount of packages. You can't do any C kind of libraries. Um, so that makes it a little bit more difficult if your business requires some other type of um, tools within that same job. Um, managed Airflow, I would say, has its limitations, of course. Um, we're talking about cron scheduling, usually. And this is like the old Airflow, right? Um, you would also have to worry about your AWS infrastructure having to be set in a certain way for your Apache Airflow to be set up and be able to be used. Um, you're also talking about the time, the date time from um, Airflow. If you guys ever use Airflow, you, you know that sometimes it doesn't really run on the time. It kind of runs on the ETC and a, you know, a time beforehand as well. Um, uh, and then step functions, right? We have tax task executions limits, you have API throttling, you have a lot of things that can happen and you kind of need to understand those to be able to create all the solutions that you want for all your data pipelines, right? Um, benefits, of course, you know, Lambda layers, you can introduce that into Lambda, um, customize the code a little bit with AWS Glue. I feel like one of the best things from there is those Glue connections that makes it really easy to be able to communicate with your different databases or different um, data repositories. Um, job bookmarks has been growing and has been updating. Um, now I believe AWS has like a little bit of a job bookmark rewind for to let you actually re-ingest data if there's been a problem. Um, you know, cataloging, crawlers, all of those are very, a lot of benefits to Glue. Um, you do know how, need to know what are your best practices too, and sometimes that's a little bit of a headache, especially with crawlers and um, cataloging, right? You gotta have a specific format where it'll work the best for you, and um, you kinda have to understand if you wanna keep the internal process into the best practice formats, and then leave only the end wherever you're data should be at or tar you know your target location in that should be the format that you want that to be but for internal process you should keep it as what's recommended which usually is like you know blue parquet you want it to be compressed with snappy um, all that type of information for your catalog and your crawlers to work um, as properly and best as possible right um, and then for managed apache airflow one of the biggest benefits for me is that ui right Usually some of your end users don't really understand the process of the ETL workflow and your UI is there to let have to let people have that visual, right? You can also, you know, redo some of those jobs. And some people or maybe your end users who are not as technically as, as advanced as your engineers will have an understanding on how to look at metrics, how to run jobs, um, look to see if there was a problem, look at some logging, you know, and, and that's very a pretty good um good tool to use for, you know, if they're not that advanced, right? You also have that customization. Like you can use any type of Python package there onto that, um, onto your jobs, onto your tasks, if you wanna just run Python, right? Or if you want to possibly customize the query that you're doing to a database, you can also create your own hooks, your own connections. It makes it very, um, 
customizable for an engineer to be able to utilize Airflow as much as possibly um, in the best way that they can. And then, of course, you know, the different types of connections. Um, AWS Glue is great, but Apache Airflow has a much more abundant, um, air, you know, different connections that you're able to use, you can create. Um, you have third parties making their own connections and posting it there for open source and free to look at as well if you want to introduce something and make it even more complicated than they have it, right? Um, and then Ceph Functions, right? Ceph Functions is really very good to utilize for different um, AWS kind of workflows, right? If you want to use you know, S3 events, you want to use SNS, SQS, different multiple jobs for Lambda in parallel or in series, whatever is there for you, and you can do that in, a, in step functions as well. So you just got to know what the limits and benefits is for each service and kind of understand. And of course, when you implement, you're probably going to come across a lot of problems and you just got to you know, debug through that. Um, one thing I would want to talk about, because I I use Apache Airflow for a long time. I've used the old versions, unmanaged, managed, and I've come across a lot of things that are happening right now with managed Apache Airflow, where we can kind of transform this only on scheduler to be more of an on-demand. And I feel like this is very unutilized for Airflow itself because we can use you know, this event-driven AWS Lambda to run our AWS Apache Airflow jobs as well, making it a little bit more event driven than we would think of just as a, a scheduled, you know, a workflow orchestration. Um, usually, you know, managed airflow is used for or orchestration. It's not really meant to be used as, you know, a machine that will transform your data um, or not. So it is something I feel like a lot of people kind of kind of have gone away from it just because we do have things like you know, Lambda or Glue that can do the same things and step functions as well, right? But this is a really good tool to let your users who aren't going to be technical be able to have a visual of it too. And then the people who are, or users that are like engineers that are very technical can go into it and customize it as much as possible for your business that you want um, and have it either scheduled or event driven. It depends on how you use it and all the tools that you need to use with Airflow as well. Um, next thing is, is your, is your code portable, dynamic, scalable? And this is something I talked about for, um, you know, having those Python packages, creating jars, creating any type of portability for the, for that code, have it in somewhere where you're going to be releasing, deploying, being, having it controlled. So that way nothing gets kind of, um, no bug gets introduced in the, in the long run. Right. Um, in a lot of the AWS tools like Glue, Lambda, um, EMRs, um, containers, Kubernetes, all that can have Python packages. And that's one of the things that I feel like I've seen in most best practice documentation blogs from AWS is that they really do like having your Python packages be used, right? Putting them in an S3 repository, um, packaging that, um, that the, that code, that script, uh, whatever that's needed to be able to do transforms or anything else. And you can add that to most of your jobs in AWS in a very easy way. Um, and, and it works pretty well, fast. It's, I've never seen um, package code take time to unpack, to be used within all these job runs as well. Um, implementation. So once you start implementing, this is, this is where you start getting into the nitty gritty. You start to you know, um, implement all your POC, all of your processes for the ETL. Um, you also start to find the problems, right? Not always your third party tools are able to address or get connections to or be able to dump data in a specific way. Data doesn't come in nicely. Um, and you really do have to dedicate the time to do that type of work, right? Um, you want to create, first and foremost, I always like to create my CI CD pipeline, um, probably use AWS code pipeline if they don't have something already, um, or, you know, Bitbucket or any other third party tool that you can use for Git and whatnot. Um, and then create those release or deployment pipelines, right? You want to create something simple at first, uh, make sure that your code is there, let it be containerized, or if you have a Python package to be created, have it be created there and then placed in S3 or in some place that it's secure. 
So that's what I would kind of kind of go through first. And then afterwards, it's kind of looking at that orchestration and the ETL jobs, right? In the design, did you did you create documentation for it? Did you create a, a visual workflow for it? And that's something that I would do um, just so I can know what tools I need to add in. If I'm using infrastructure as code, which I usually am, um, do I put it in cloud formation? Do I parameterize it? Um, how many stacks do I need? How many services within the stacks do I need? What's the dependency? What's not? And then what what are your outputs, right? And that's something that I would do in implementation as I'm creating my cloud formation stacks, as I'm creating my Python packages, and then of course this data pipeline within my deployments. And um, afterwards is, you know, is my data good? Is it valid? Is it clean enough for my end users, which could be your data scientists, it could be a process which is going to do modeling and see that that data is coming in as best as possible. And, you know, uh, do test data, of course. Um, you can use test data um, that's not part of business logic, but I would recommend using data that would be used within your production. You know, get a little sampling of it, random samples, introduce problems within that data, and then try to see if you can capture all that. Um, and that's kind of coming in with that continuous integration, right? Continuous deployment. You want your source control. Um, a lot of clients that I've seen has been using Terraform for infrastructure as code. I use CloudFormation still with some clients, and you know I try to put that in my Git and then have that in S3 where it's secure, where you know there won't be no problems, there's no introduced bugs, no one's going to make an update on it without it being visible first in your first um, step of getting this release. Right. Um, so that's just something that I would like to do for continuous integration for a client. Because sometimes they don't have that already set, or they have that set, but it's not really in the ETL process. They actually have it more on the software engineering of the application side or of another product that they have. And you kind of want to introduce them, introduce the ETL process with that same continuous integration. And of course, deployment, of course. And for deployment, talk about you know code pipeline, code commit. You can add your code there, um, create those Python packages I was talking about, or you know your Java jar files um, for your EMRs, depending on what type of tools that you'll use. You kind of want to start getting into it and start creating these type of things because they make things a lot more simple whenever you add this code into all those jobs that you want to kind of introduce for your ETL um, pipeline. Um, and then here, just talking about the same stuff, right? You kind of want to map out your business logic using that continuous integration and then you know what job tasks greatly benefit from that cron schedule or events or on-demand runs right or um, use all the tools that you need to orchestrate one pipeline workflow um, which is you know so something that's kind of important i feel like it, it gets left out a lot and it's, it's something that's very useful at the end um, Let's see, account for potential issues, of course, um, integrate solutions and tests, right? We also have our test deployments. Um, and here for the, you know, continuous deployment, you know, use your cron triggers that you have. Um, you can create an AWS glue job and then have multiple types of cron triggers. Um, glue triggers is what they call it and have, you can even add in the different parameters that you need for that job for each trigger there. Uh, it makes it very useful to have that um, file there and being able to have that as supportable as you want or as dynamic as you want for all your different projects that use that same code base. Uh, and the same thing with the crawler, you know, cron triggers, um, your job triggers, it's just the same thing. Um, and then for the S3 events, there's that thing that you can do, what I, which I mentioned before, right? You use AWS Lambda, you can run that Airflow DAG on demand um, by running it by running it via the Lambda itself. Um, you have your workflows, your SEP functions, state machine, all those different tools that you would be able to use the S3 events for event dripping processes. Validation. Validation is another thing that I feel gets a little bit left behind, but you know, you can use tools for it. Um, we need to make sure that our pipeline executes at a specific time if that's what your client needs, right? Um, you got to look at the metrics. You got to look at your CloudWatch metrics. If you have Airflow, you use the metrics there. Um, kind of have to see how long does your actual job run. 
um, you want to actually add in the timeouts, the SLAs, the missed SLAs. That way you're able to control that job as much as possible. Um, and then also introduce like, if it's not valid, if your job like, you know, does it, it does it error out? Do you want to add possibly some um, re, how, how do you, rerun, right? You want to kind of rerun the same job. Is it possible? Is it going to cause an issue? Do you want to see the steps? And you kind of want to add this kind of in the steps that you're doing your ETL, like make a note of it, be able to introduce a bug and be able to validate the job as it runs and get the metrics for it to see what happens in case that does happen. And that's something that would be super powerful because you're accounting for errors that are not there. And you're accounting for the errors whenever you make a product or this you know, process and you have this end product, you want it to be live. And then you're able to give those metrics to you know, whoever it is that are actual, you know, responsible for data at the end as well. So it's not a bad thing to actually account for these type of things before you even go live and test that out, of course. Um, operationalize, let's see here. Um, ensure that the data is, you know, production ready. And we talked about having that valid, um, have it ready for machine learning, or if it's going to be used for analytics, for your end reporting dashboards, your quick sites, make sure your data is properly um, cleaned, valid, you know, true, compared, right, you know, whatever it is that you want to do for your validations or your QA, right? Um, you can use Airflow, as I mentioned, you know, you can have an orchestration there. Uh, you can use CloudWatch for your metrics as well. And just establish those procedures that I mentioned about your handling your data issues. Um, if there's a problem, you know, AWS Blue, you can do those rewinds that I mentioned. Um, see why that data is not good. What's happening to that data? Why is there an error? Why is this one value causing such an issue? And then recheck your code, of course, you know, update the code and source control, do another release, see what's the problem. And that's kind of, kind of how it would should be operating, right? Whenever we do these um, debugging, you want to capture all these problems and have it visible for, you know, your team or if someone else um, that needs to look at it or for the end user, whoever it is, um, they would have that information, that metric, and that'll be very useful for them to understand how value should be coming in too. So. All right, um, clean and prepare real-time data and batch data. And this is talking about, you know, having that um, kind of like valid QA testing of your data. You wanna transform this data, have all the transformations, complex transformations that you have, and you wanna be able to run it via, you know, you can, you can run it via AWS Glue Studio, you know, studio notebooks, interactive sessions, but this kind of falls into what's the best practice and what is your most cost efficient there too, because granted, Clue Studio notebooks aren't as cheap. Um, not sure about your interactive sessions there, but, and it's still a notebook, so it'll probably end up running some serverless uh, machines there. Um, and then of course, your Glue Studio. Glue Studio, it's kind of difficult because you have to implement on the session itself and um, you kind of, it, it depends, right? If you're using the notebook on Glue Studio, well, it's pretty good, but you talk about how much are you really going to be spending to be able to test your code. Um, but doing it the other way is difficult as well because you're talking about time as well. So how long is it going to take you to run one code? If there's a bug, you have to wait till it's finished, till the machine is done, it's uh, removed because you can't run usually on concurrent sessions. Um, and no, that all depends on knowing your, you know, knowing your service that you're able to use um, there. Um, I see here some process Internet of Things streams in real time. Um, develop streaming jobs visually and glue streaming. These aren't bad. Um, this gives you time to kind of understand how that da data is flowing in or streaming in as they call it um, by, you know, using Spark from the Glue Studio and being able to stream um, you know, this data. Uh, kind of do batching of each stream that you're doing. That's a possibility of doing that. Um, using the glue elastic views the data brew that's all possible to transform right you don't need to write code for that transformation data brew you can use what's there um as a 
you know, as a developer, or if you do want to use code, you can as well. It depends on what you're doing um, and what you want to do there. Uh, let's see. Modern data platform and role of AWS Glue. So talk about Glue a little bit. Glue has been improving a lot, to be honest. Um, I've been using some Glue right now, creating my AWS Lake formation, and it's really great when I'm demoing or doing a proof of concept as of a data pipeline to a client, right? I'm able to, if they have Excel spreadsheets, which has been a reoccurring thing for me, um, I can use Data Brew, get that worksheet data uh, per sheet, you know, available for them, put it on a job, create a create the flow, create the the data that's going to be transitioned from the Excel to Glue Parquet, let the crawler run, and have that you know, data available within Athena, and then I can demo that to them. And they really like to see that. They they really enjoy to see how that process from, you know, some Excel spreadsheet that's not cleaned up, that has a lot of problems within it. And they like to see in Athena where I can point out what the problems are, right? Or if there's another issue, I can point it out because they have it there visually. And, they, and it's really great for them to see because they can really understand why, say, a developer engineer would have a problem, right? You can tell them, hey, look, this data, this isn't great. This, is, this isn't how it should be coming in. Or you can tell them, like, this formatting issue, right? There's a formatting issue. Um, you know, please review what's your process of getting your data there. Maybe there's an issue down, like, from the beginning. Maybe whoever added that um, data from the, their portal, from their application has didn't do something right, or maybe there's a, a bug within that code as well that's letting that faulty data come in. So that's a really good, powerful thing to do uh, whenever you do a POC or you know you want to demo that data to them, um, which is great. Uh, I've recently had to use say DynamoDB to be able to, um, I guess, manage the quick site access users. And what I mean by that is uh, whenever we create namespaces and we create reports or what they call the dashboards there, um, in some of my projects, I have had to have multiple different users um, from different clients within our client, right? Or what departments is what we would call them. Um, and, you know, we've used a DynamoDB table that would be able to edit this user's access and be able to implement that onto the quick site um, side by creating Lambda triggers from, you know, DynamoDB, which was very, very powerful tool. Um, you can really see, and it makes it really easy to integrate as well. So those are kind of the things that we, you know, I kind of looked at for AWS Glue, you know, um, see what's useful, see what's not, um, implement as much as you can. Um, also, make sure that your jobs are as efficient as possible by, you know, reducing those timeouts, um, adding if you want concurrency with this job or not, um, minimizing as much as you can all the the workers that you'll be using there too. Um, default, I believe, is like 10 workers, but when you're doing a POC, you don't need all those workers. So, you know, you minimize it up to two. I believe now a certain region is able to scale that up automatically up to the number of workers that you want, uh, which is nice. Um, would be great if it was on all regions, so that way we can all use that. But, um, you know, um, progress goes a little bit slow whenever they're doing their testing as well. So just going to wait for that to get improve um, and get better, of course. Um, and that talks about, you know, performance and cost efficiency, right? You kind of want to do it as minimal as possible before you blow it up and you scale it up, um, depending on how much data you're going to receive too. And that's one of the main things, like understand how much data your client is actually going to be dropping or you're streaming or you're, you know, doing whatever it needs, because if not, you're using too much machines, too many workers, and that cost goes up really quickly. Um, you know, kind of centralize the catalog and governance, um, kind of understand what all the catalog can do um, with, with your data and understand where this data is going, how to protect it, how to secure it, how to encrypt it, make sure only your end tools or users are able to access it, you know, do as much as you can for that, with that respect. Um, let's see, tools for diverse skill sets. and. That's an interesting, and I feel like I've been talking about that this whole time, right? You know, you want to make sure you got all the tools that you can use specifically to the business logic um, that you can. And 
you know, it's not just looking at AWS Lake Formation, AWS Fluent only stay there. But if you see that there's a need um, for another tool, it's really easy to introduce that into this pipeline, right? So don't be scared to just, or don't get boggled down to just one tool, just use as many as you can. Um, creating a more efficient, cost-effective ETL. And that's coming across, you know, scheduling, event-driven, um, the type of services that you want to use. AWS Glue here, as example, you know, you don't have to worry about infrastructure. Um, you don't have to worry about a lot of other things that's going to be coming in when you're talking about an ETL process. Um, and I mean, like, you know, you can create notebooks if you want to stay with notebooks. You can create a script, a uh, part PySpark script. If you don't need PySpark, you can just use Python. You're able to do that with AWS Glue Jobs. Um, you know, also, do you want to only have one job running at once, or do you want multiple jobs running at once? Um, that timeout also, you know, reduce that timeout, and that's going to make it more cost effective overall. If you do start adjusting those job parameters that you need to. Okay, um, connect, extract, and externally manage real-time and batch data from into different data. And this is talking about AWS Glue specifically too, because we have our Glue connectors. We can connect to min multiple different types of databases. We can connect, if possible, on S3. Um, you know, we can use our Glue crawlers if we don't have the schemas for certain type of data. Uh, we do have to play around with that a little bit because sometimes, not all of that data is easily understandable, right? Sometimes our glue crawlers won't know if this data type is a string or if it should be an nth or a double. And we kind of want to go over it to make sure it's doing the right thing that we want. And if not, we need to adjust it. We need to edit it. We, made it, we need to make sure that it's discovering that you know schema well. Um, what is the best kind of practice for glue crawlers as well? Like, I've come across a project where um, you know, my client was dropping in CSV files. Um, it was reading them, and to be honest, it wasn't really crawling it to the data catalog that well. So one thing that I did was just read it from, you know, the glue job itself. Like read the S3 file there, convert that into a glue parquet, um, putting the schema that I wanted it that it should have been, and then dumping that back out. So. I had to do a little bit of transformation before I glue crawled it. And once I glue crawled it and I did those transformation and kind of cleaned up that data, then the crawler was able to crawl this data more effortlessly because it's in a format that it really likes. Um, you're making sure you're doing partitions on it, partition it by the day, by the timestamp. It has been really great um, having that there. And also a lot of my clients like to see that, you know, this job, this data was dumped and this is the timestamp for that data. So it really does let me look back and go and see if there was any issues because we do, you know, we're doing these incremental um, updates, right? We're doing these inter uh, incremental um, data jobs basically that will, you know, have that data there visible for you to do, you know, whatever debugging that you would need to do. So this was really good for the uh, glue crawlers and something that I've kind of learned um, on my, on my own a bit when I was doing this because uh, sometimes, yeah, those CSV files, if you have quotes or you don't have quotes, it'll be a big issue for the crawlers and they won't understand a lot of that data if it's there like that. Um, and, you know, after, you know, you have that glue data catalog, you can use Athena, you know, do your queries there, see what that looks like. It's a really good visual tool for you to use to look at it and see how that data, you know, is coming in for the catalog. Um, and then of course you can also have your schema registry, right? You can discover it, control it, evolve it. Um, it's really great. Kind of have to do certain types of things once you want to have that data as much as you want to have it for your machine learning um, or any kind of data analysis. Or if you need it for your data scientists to you know, work with, just make sure that they have the proper schemas that they want for that data too. Let's see. Unifying the data catalog with automated schema discovery. Now, this is just breaking down a little bit of that data catalog, right? Um, by having that schema discovery and management, right? And you can do that here, as obviously it's written out. Um, I haven't had the need to use it yet, but um, I'm sure that this is a very good way of taking care of that schema of those data types um, of that data, right? So here it's gonna talk about a little bit of that um, 
metadata essentially is going to be available for querying, for the productivity. Um, you put it in this schema discovery management, it'll take care of that with the data catalog, and then you're able to output that to um, whatever that you need it for, right? Let's see. Uh, glue connectors. So I've had to use a little bit of these glue connectors. Um, it is very powerful because you don't have to worry about exposing you know, um, your username, passwords, or any type of other security measures that you're trying to do and you're trying to connect to a different service. Um, you can just add that to your jobs and reference it on your code and it's there. It's available for you to use. Um, I like to use mine for a SQL Server. It's really nice. You know, just reading that whole table using dynamic frames. And um, after that, you know, do what you need to do to clean up that data and use the data that you need to do the transformations. Um, it's really great. So it's really good because I guess one powerful thing about it is aside from you're able to, you know, secure your all your information for connecting to a database or a third party service, it's also creating your job once you create your job once it runs into that security group or that vpn tunnel wherever it is that your um, data should be able to access to and it's creating that job there where you won't have to worry about that you won't you don't have to worry about creating a glue job with you know known security groups or if you need some access control happening and that's taking care of that because that's already set to be um at in that security group or you know, VPN or whatever it is, or VPC that you're working with, right? So it's it's a really good tool. I use it a lot, to be honest. Um, let's see. Next steps. And I'll hand that over to Marty. I'm actually going to hand that over to Ryan. <laughs> okay. Thanks. No problem. Hey everyone, uh, great stuff, Ashley. Really appreciated all the content there. Um, I'm gonna just kick off a little bit of a, of a poll in a second. Ashley, if you can go to the next slide. I um, hope you all enjoyed the content today. There's several questions um, out there that, that we'll try to get to. Um, you know, if you look at the mission website, you know, we have a bunch of, of blogs and other documentation out there. We also give uh, online workshops for AWS uh, tooling. So if you have any questions, you you guys are looking for a workshop, you know, get in touch. We can definitely help you uh, along those fronts. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also offer for customers. Next slide, actually. We also offer for customers uh, what we call uh, SA on demand. Um, Oh, I guess that's the slide after. So, you know, we, we're all data driven, right? And, you know, if you guys are looking for support, you guys need help, uh, you know, come to mission, talk to us, we can get, you know, support for you guys. We can help you out. We can help you with your data governance strategy, just all of your data strategy, anything that you're looking for. Uh, if you're looking for support, you know, here's that, that poll that I threw out there. Um, you know, this lets us get in touch with you guys. If you're you're interested, um, feel free to to click on that that poll. Uh, we'll just give it you know a, a short period. And while the poll's up, Ashley, I've got a question for you. Um, the first question was, why use MWAA DAGs over AWS Glue workflows? Um, that's a good question. Um... Usually it would be because um, sometimes that AWS glue job can't handle certain patches from Python. And I would have to create my, or customize my own container to be able to do that work uh, and run, run there. Another reason would be because I'm, I'm able to use different services there too where I'm able to customize and run and access to different services that possibly Glue can't do, or Glue may have to have trouble doing as well. Um, and that would be one of the reasons I, I would probably go for Airflow versus the, um, you know, a AWS Glue itself. Um, sometimes it can also be where this, the SLA would probably be a little trouble because um, if I want it to retry, um 
there's a way to dynamically retry it, how many more retries I want to do on AWS Airflow. Um, secondly would be that orchestration and metrics. Uh, sometimes it's an easier way to integrate that metrics, um, maybe from Datadog or some other type of metrics uh, where I'm able to have Airflow be able to give that information. Um, another thing would be seeing how, whenever you run that task in a DAG, um, that task may be a different service and you can kind of see or create your own like custom code that will let you see like if that task is still running um, and you're able to see that within the Airflow uh, UI. Cool. Um, another question, last question, I guess, since we only have two minutes, minutes left. Sorry, we're, we're not getting to all the questions. What has improved for AWS Blue Job bookmarks and how can you uh, use that? Uh, one thing I've mentioned uh, during this was um, how you can use that for ingesting incremental data. Um, if you already have data that you've ingested, that bookmark would let, you know, the job know that it's already ingested so it won't ingest that data again that will prevent um, duplications and an improvement from that would be that rewind option that you're able to do so you're able to rewrite rewind that bookmark and re-ingest that data if you need to or if there was a problem down the line um, that's a pretty powerful tool i think uh that has been improved on for aws glue awesome appreciate uh everyone's time today appreciate uh, you know, everyone's staying till till the end here. If you have any additional questions, you know, feel free to to email us or or get in touch. You know, we're happy to answer them. Um, and with that, have a great rest of your Tuesday, everyone. Signing off.